Yeah, we are just about to get started. Wonderful, we've got people from all over the United States joining us tonight, which is really exciting. Um, don't see anyone from Mars yet, but uh, there's still a few minute, few seconds left before we actually get started. Uh, my background here is our diorama of Mars at the Museum of Nature and Science. All right, hello everyone and welcome to 60 Minutes in Space. Uh, we're very excited to share this program with you. My name is Mitch and I'm a performer here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and I'll be your virtual host this evening. And as I mentioned, if you have questions during the program, please put them in the chat. You won't see everybody's chat, but I will. And I'll be uh, tracking all of your questions so that we can have our space scientists answer them tonight. And so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kachun Yu, Assistant Curator of Space Science here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. All right, well, thank you very much, Mitch. And hello, good evening, everyone um, out there in um, all across the country, it looks like. Welcome to 60 Minutes in Space, as Mitch has said. Um, this is our monthly recap of uh, some of the uh, most interesting things and exciting news that um, we um, can think of um, that has happened um, over the past month. Um, joining me um, tonight uh, will be uh, Naomi uh, Paquette. And um, we have sort of divvied up the news into stuff um, that is happening outside of our solar system, which is um, what I will be covering. And uh, Naomi will be covering um, things that have ha occurred um, inside our, our solar system. Um, and uh, a lot of you are probably aware of the, um, the Perseverance rover landing on Mars. And so she's gonna be going over all that and, and everything that's happening with the rover. So stay tuned to that. So um, I'm gonna I'm go ahead and share uh, my screen and get started. And um, I have um, two stories that um, I want to um, talk about. And the first one is about the, um, the <clears throat> black hole Cygnus X1. And um, Cygnus X1 is, is actually um, the very first uh, black hole um, that was discovered. And um, it, um, so it's um, close to about 50 years old. And um, it, it was discovered, um, again, like all black holes, um, not because we could um, easily observe it. Um, black holes are extraordinarily difficult to observe uh, because they um, themselves don't emit any light. But um, and when a black hole is in a binary system, it's in orbit around another star, um, gas can get uh, pulled in um, towards the black hole, it piles up into an accretion disk, and as, that, um, as the gas orbits the black hole in that disk, it um, heats up because of friction, and it can get heated to millions of degrees, and um, you can get um, very energetic x-rays and other emissions from it. Um, it's also thought that interactions between the black hole and the disk can drive um, jets, um, so that you have jets of material coming out. And um, as I said, um, you know, Cygnus X1 was the, the very first um, uh, possible black hole um, source that was discovered. And for a long time, people weren't even sure whether it was a black hole or not. Uh, there was actually a very famous bet between Caltech physicist Kip Thorne and uh, Stephen Hawking about whether it was in fact a black hole or not. Um, Stephen Hawking actually bet it wasn't a, a black hole. And so he actually lost that bet and he had to pay up. And I would have to look up to see what, um, what, he, what they actually bet. Um, but uh, <clears throat> so Cygnus um, X1 um, basically involves a black hole. Um, and uh, the, the discovery, um, the recent discovery is that it's much bigger than people thought it used to be. And so now we, um, know uh, that the black hole is about um, 20 times, 21 times the mass of our sun. Previously, we thought it was only about 15 times. So um, it's about 50% bigger. Uh, the, um, the star that, um, is in, in that the black hole um, is orbiting, um, actually both are orbiting around a um, common center of gravity, um, is about 20 times, uh, 22 times the diameter of our sun, but it's just over 40 times the mass of our sun. And the way that they discovered um, the, that uh, the black hole um, is much more massive was uh, using radio telescopes and basically having an improved distance measurement. And so they used a um, technique um, called parallax 
And um, you can basically approximate what astronomers do if you stuck your thumb out in front of, of you and you looked at your thumb um, with one eye closed and then by switching to the other eye and you'll notice that your thumb um, appears to move against the background. You know, whether you're looking at um, a distant wall or a bookcase or a tree in your yard, um, your thumb will appear to shift. And that's just because your two eyes are looking at the thumb relative to the background um, in slightly different directions. And so astronomers can use the same technique, but um, they have to use distant galaxies. And so here is a, um, a short video that basically explains um, what um, astronomers, um, how astronomers discovered on this. And so here's an, an animation of Cygnus X1. And what they did was they um, used a network of radio um, telescopes, uh, 10 of them across the United States, the very long baseline array. And um, the, the, um, this array allows you to very accurately uh, measure the positions of radio sources. And here, um, this animation is showing how they're able to observe um, the black hole system uh, from different um, sides of the Earth's orbit. And as it, uh, the Earth orbits around the sun, the, uh, the black hole uh, system appears to shift against uh, background galaxies. And then um, when we zoom up um, to it, um, previously um, we had thought that the uh, system was just over 6,000 light years away. And again, uh, the black hole was about uh, 15 times the mass of, of our sun, but now with a much more accurate distance, it, um, it's further away, it's um, about 7,200 light years away. And um, also as a result, the uh, black hole um, became bigger. And, and also the star um, also became bigger as well uh, because with a star um, that's further away, um, it has to be brighter and the, um, the star radius um, is also larger. And so that um, changes the, uh, the measurements for um, everything in that system. And then uh, the other thing that they had to correct for is that um, you're measuring um, radio waves um, from the black hole, but um, the um, cloud of gas, um, the, the wind that's being emitted um, by the star um, can affect um, your radio measurements. And so they had to correct for that um, in order to uh, make a much more accurate uh, measurement. And um, so there's that animation. And, um, and what the, um, the astronomers also did was, um, so, the, so they spent about um, almost a week um, with the very large uh, baseline array making these measurements. The um, measure, individual measurements themselves um, took place over about a 12 hour span. And that's just because these telescopes were spread out um, throughout the Western hemisphere from Puerto Rico across the continental US to uh, Hawaii. And so it takes um, that long for the earth to rotate um, and uh, for um, Cygnus X1 um, to be um, observable from each of the different locations. And so this uh, figure from the, the paper uh, basically shows you um, the different measurements that um, were made. Um, and they also include um, a number of um, measurements um, from 2011. Um, and so the red ones are the, uh, are the measurements that were made recently, the six measurements. Um, and uh, because the, uh, the orbit of the black hole um, system uh, takes place um, just under six days. It's like five and a half days. That means those um, six day measurements um, allow you to, um, to sample um, the system um, through one complete orbit. So, so that was actually uh, very important because the previous um, 2011 re results only sampled um, a fraction of, of that orbit. And um, what um, we now um, know is now uh, is that um, Cygnus X1 is basically the largest black hole um, that um, was discovered uh, without um, using uh, the new uh, gravitational wave detectors that you might have heard about in the news and that we've talked about in past 60 Minutes in Spaces uh, presentations. And so um, the LIGO detectors, for instance, um, have been measuring uh, collisions of black holes, um, and these are black holes uh, with masses um, on the, uh, you know, they, uh, they're um, at a minimum of about 50 solar masses, but now um, this one is the largest at 21 solar masses that um, has been detected through uh, more traditional telescopic techniques. And uh, what's interesting is that, whoops, with the, um, um, <clears throat> with this new result, astronomers have to sort of rethink about how uh, massive stars 
evolve because um, the, the, uh, this is actually a double massive star. The, the other star is a massive O star and the progenitor um, star to uh, this black hole was probably about 60 times the mass of the sun. But um, when these massive stars die or before they die, they uh, pump out um, huge amounts of radiation, but they also lose mass through um, stellar winds. And it was thought that, um, that the amount of, based on the amount of mass that, was, um, that would be lost through um, computer models and other um, evolutionary models for these stars, um, the, the most massive a black hole could be would be right around 15 solar masses. So basically um, what the previous uh, mass for Cygnus X1 was thought to be. But now that uh, we know Cygnus X, X1 um, is closer to 21 solar masses, that means astronomers really have to rethink um, the models for um, these um, supermassive stars and to think about you know, how, um, they, um, could, how they could lose less mass in order for the remnant black hole to be much uh, larger after the star goes supernova. All right, so with that, I'm gonna um, now uh, next um, talk about how um, solar systems form. And so um, I do um, end up talking a little bit about our solar system. Uh, but um, if you look at a um, images of um, our solar system or to at least look at the orbits, um, we see that we have um, what we call the terrestrial planets, the Earth-like planets, Mercury, Venus, um, Earth and Mars that are orbit, uh, orbiting much closer to the sun. And you have the gas giants um, that are orbiting uh, much further away, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then there's also this third zone in the solar system that we now know a lot more about called the Kuiper Belt. And Pluto is kind of the king of the Kuiper Belt. There are uh, many, uh, probably hundreds of thousands, if not billions of objects out there that are uh, much smaller and much icier. And so um, astronomers, and planetary scientists um, trying to understand um, how the solar system form, um, we basically have to explain all these different um, aspects of the solar system. Why are the planets um, made up of the things that they are made up of and how do they uh, form or um, end up in the distances or in the parts of the solar system that they're at. So um, you know, one question is um, why um, are the inner planets all mostly rocky? So if you look at uh, the four inner planets, um, they, um, three of them do have um, atmospheres, but the atmospheres are pretty thin compared to the size of the planet. Uh, you can almost think of them as like being the apple skin on an apple. It's just a thin veneer on the surfaces, um, covering the surfaces of these worlds. Uh, Mercury, of course, doesn't have um, any atmosphere at all. Um, but when you compare them to the gas giants, um, we think that they do have um, small pores, um, small relative to um, the entire planet, but um, most of them uh, are um, just contain um, gases um, or the, the bulk of um, the matter is in the form of gas. And so um, they're basically uh, mostly atmospheres, although um, for Uranus and Neptune, um, another term for them um, are ice giants because it turns out that they contain substantial amounts of um, water and methane and, and ammonia ices underneath um, their, um, the gas layers. And so why is it these outer planets um, end up with lots of gas um, and not that much rock? And, um, and basically um, we, we think that uh, based on both um, theory and um, observations and computer simulations um, that our solar system um, evolved from a um, collapsed um, disk of gas and dust. And uh, this gas and dust um, circled or orbited the sun. And um, looking at different um, simulations, this is a, uh, from a planetarium show from our friends at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. But um, we see um, computer simulations showing how matter can accrete. Um, smaller um, dust sized grains can grow um, and stick onto uh, and grow into bigger pebbles. Those pebbles can grow into boulders and so forth until you get into larger planetesimals. And then um, the other thing that can happen is that um, these objects can gravitationally um, interact with each other and especially interact with the larger planets like Jupiter. And so over time, um, if you, even if you start off with a disk 
of objects that's relatively flat, um, a lot of objects can actually get ejected. Uh, the orbits of the planets can actually change and um, they can um, either uh, move closer or move further away or um, a little bit of both. And, um, and, and over time, um, the solar system gets cleared out and, um, and um, what you end up with is um, most of the mass um, ending up in the planets, including 99% of it going into the, um, into the planet Jupiter. And then you also have a number of remainder um, objects like asteroids and comets and those um, Kuiper Belt objects. And what these simulations show is that instead of um, having a, a nice flat um, disk, um, those um, outer um, zone of objects have orbits that are much more inclined or tilted. And so um, the solar system, instead of um, being um, you know, like a pizza, um, you basically um, get it, um, the orbits kind of fatten up um, into more um, of a torus when you look at all the orbits together. Now, um, it turns out that um, when uh, people run simulations um, of the solar system and see how you can build up the planets over time, um, there, um, you, you can't, actually can get um, solar systems that are very similar to ours, but uh, there are some um, discrepancies in there. So this is from a paper by Sean Raymond and his collaborators from 2009. And what they do is they build up uh, the planets using um, the planetesimal model where smaller and smaller objects stick together and they grow um, larger and larger until you get these um, objects that are um, 10 kilometers, hundreds of kilometers in size and they um, start um, colliding with each other and accreting with each other. And this is what um, these snapshots that I'm going to show um, from this figure in their model. Um, and um, the colors um, basically represent how much water is in those rocks um, that um, are in the system. And so um, the, on the left is um, the side that's closest to the sun. And on the right um, is the side that's further away. And so the, the rocks, the debris in the early solar system on the left, um, they would have been um, more heated by the heat and light from the sun. And so you don't expect as much water and other volatiles um, to form on them because they would just remain gases. But if you go further out where it's colder, then you would expect to see ices forming. And so you would expect to see um, water ice or ammonia ice or methane ice forming around these rocks. And so that's why you would um, expect to find um, more water and more ice in the outer solar system. But uh, that would also now beg the question of um, how does the water end up getting onto the earth? Because um, the earth obviously has enough water for life to exist. And so when they run these models, um, what they find is that um, through gravitational interactions between uh, the different objects and with um, the, the, um, the larger planets, you can get um, over uh, millions of years, um, you can get growth in these planetesimals. And so if you look closely, you'll see these bigger um, disks um, representing bigger objects. And then over time, you know, here's 10 million years, and in 30 million years, now you're starting um, to see uh, bigger and bigger objects. And then finally, after about 200 million years, um, you now get um, these relatively uh, large Earth-like, um, Earth-sized objects um, that are between the Sun and Jupiter. But um, one of the problems with these simulations is that oftentimes you get um, too many Earth-sized objects. And so it actually turns out to be somewhat difficult when they rerun these models over and over again to get an object that's more Mars size. So Mars is about um, half the um, diameter of the Earth. Um, and um, so it's much um, smaller than the Earth and it's located um, between about one and two times the distance uh, between the Earth and the, um, or between about 100, you know, the, um, the distances um, on this plot one is um, where the Earth should be. So that's one, what we call one astronomical unit. And um, one and a half is roughly where Mars is today. And then um, Jupiter is just over five astronomical units away. And so um, these models basically show too much, uh, too large of a planet forming where Mars is. And so um, the planetesimal model where the, uh, the planets accrete from larger and larger building blocks over time, um, they, um, theoreticians basically have a hard time explaining Mars. Now, 
one possible um, solution to that is to use um, is through a different model um, called the pebble accretion model. And, uh, and uh, part of the inspiration for this different model is that um, there's a lot of debris in our solar system that looks like pebbles. And so when we look at meteorites, we see um, what are called chondrules, which are these round spherical blobs that are about a millimeter, no more than a millimeter. A lot of them are um, slightly smaller than a millimeter in size. So they're basically bead-like objects. And um, on the picture on the right is um, what they look like after you've kind of broken them um, out of a, uh, a meteorite. And um, these um, chondrules are basically melted uh, bits of material. Um, and they form very soon after the solar system formed. So within millions of years. And these are um, some of the earliest bits of debris or material that have survived or that, have, uh, that are left over from the formation of the solar system. And so they contain a lot of clues as to how our solar system formed and what the early matter in our solar system was like. And uh, so we find evidence of these chondrules um, all throughout the um, space. And um, so um, one idea is, you know, perhaps instead of um, our planets being built up by um, gradually larger and larger building blocks, what if um, the inner planets um, and the outer planets were built up by um, these pebble-sized objects? And so that's what um, this pebble accretion uh, model is. And, um, and astronomers running um, um, models over the last recent um, few years um, using this um, pebble accretion model have actually been able to um, come up um, with uh, distributions of uh, planets that are um, similar to what we see in the inner solar system. So this is a plot from um, by um, Hal Levinson and his um, co-authors um, from about five years ago. And all the black dots represent um, planets that were formed in his computer models. So over uh, many dozens of simulations. And the red um, squares represent the, um, the masses and, and the distributions, uh, the, uh, the locations of Mercury, uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And so what you see is that, you know, um, depending on the simulation, you might have uh, planets with different masses and they might be distributed over a, different, a number of different distances from the sun, but there are definitely um, planets that are formed um, close to where Mercury is on this plot as well as uh, close to where um, Venus and Earth and Mars are in this plot. And you can see that we can definitely form Mars-sized objects at the right distance um, that Mars is in our solar system. So this is definitely an improvement over some of the earlier models where we had trouble forming uh, Mars um, at the right location and with the right mass. Now, the paper that I'm going to talk about is by Anders Johansson. And, uh, the, and he and the rest of his authors are from um, different countries in, um, in Europe, including Denmark and Sweden and Austria. And uh, they basically um, improve um, on the earlier models by um, looking at the pebble accretion and, uh, and taking it a step further. And what they do is they, make an, um, they um, look at um, different types of, um, of pebbles that um, could have formed um, in the early solar system. And, um, and these um, pebbles, um, the, the red ones uh, correspond um, to um, pebbles that are um, more heated by the sun. And so um, they wouldn't have as, as much water and other volatiles, while the ones that are further out past what we call the ice line or the snow line, these pebbles are in a much colder uh, place in the solar system. And so um, they form with more uh, of water and other types of materials that can form ices. And then um, what, what happens is that over time, um, you can get um, the, um, the, the pr um, planetary cores uh, forming based on collisions of larger objects. But um, what really builds up their size is this continual rain of pebbles. And so um, we, the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune have been found to have been, at least their cores um, can form through the pebble technique. And then once their, um, their solid cores grow large enough, um, they can gravitationally attract all the um, surrounding gas 
that's in the solar nebula. So that's how those outer gas giants grow to be so big, um, just because they get big enough uh, from the population of pebbles to, um, to grow enough mass to gravitationally draw in all the gas. But there isn't enough gas in the inner solar system, so the inner solar system continues to grow just uh, mostly from pebbles. And then over time, the pebbles can also migrate um, through um, the solar system. So you get um, some of the, um, and then the, uh, the sun actually um, dims after its initial formation. And so the ice line actually moves in. And so now you have pebbles um, that um, have more ices um, in them that can now accrete onto the inner planets. And so over time, you basically get a situation where um, you have um, here, they're um, actually forming Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then you might um, look at this previous picture, you notice that there's actually four worlds there. Uh, Mercury isn't actually part of this model. The authors think that Mercury actually formed via a, a slightly different technique. But um, what this is actually showing is not only Earth, but the impactor, the, um, the Earth side, um, the slightly um, uh, half, um, an object that was about um, half the size of the Earth that impacted the Earth and that led to the um, creation of the moon. And so um, now we finally have Venus, Earth and the moon and Mars um, after the run of this model. And here is a plot showing um, how the, um, the masses of the, the four, um, of Venus, Earth, and um, T uh, stands for Theia, which is the object that collided with the Earth to form the moon, and, um, and, and M is for Mars. And so it shows how the masses of um, all four of these objects evolved over time. And uh, the red lines um, show how much of their mass was um, contributed uh, from the planetesimos, which are the, the larger objects. And then so um, actually most of the mass is actually coming from the pebbles. Um, so um, on the order of about 90% um, <clears throat> um, for um, Earth and, and Venus. And then um, this plot shows um, the amount of water that's um, being contributed by the pebbles um, to um, the Earth. And so those lines, um, what we're seeing is um, we're seeing um, the mass of the Earth get larger and larger as you follow the blue lines uh, from the left to the right. And, um, and then what happens is after at about 2% of the current mass of the Earth, the Earth is now big enough that um, when the pebbles with water or ices fall in, um, they heat up so much that um, the ices instantly sublimate. They turn into um, water vapor. And so at that point, you actually can't get any much uh, more water um, being uh, deposited onto the earth. And so um, we're basically seeing um, the, um, uh, the increase in the amount of water. And then as the earth continues to grow, uh, the fraction of water uh, decreases. And so um, what's really interesting is that, um, you know, this is a way for um, the solar system's inner worlds to grow um, with water. Um, and, um, and it sort of explains how we, um, you know, we seem to have um, pretty good evidence that um, all of the, um, the worlds, um, Venus, um, Earth, and Mars, the inner worlds, actually did, probably did have substantial amounts of water. But the question is, how did they get that? And, um, and this does a really good job of explaining it. Um, and, um, and so this um, also um, gives us hope that other planets in our um, galaxy, um, we are discovering more and more planets all the time, including Earth-like worlds around um, sun-like um, stars. Uh, that gives us hope that um, they can also, um, could have pot uh, potentially substantial amounts of water. So with that, I wanna um, turn it over to Naomi, um, who will um, begin her half of the presentation. Thanks, Kachin. Um, and that was a great transition to talking about the solar system. We've been seeing a lot of questions about Mars in the chat. We'll obviously talk more about Mars here as well, because Mars is truly the highlight of the month. All right, can you all see that? Okay, hopefully. 
Um, and so we've had three different spacecraft arrive to Mars this month, one from China, one from the United Arab Emirates, and of course the Perseverance rover um, from NASA coming to Mars. And we've been seeing some questions in the chat around water on Mars, um, the atmosphere on Mars. And this is all really relevant because Perseverance's mission is to study the astrobiology and the potential for life in the past on Mars and maybe even detect some evidence of microbial life on the red planet. So let's dive into this particular mission. It's been really exciting. Um, this is an image actually taken from an interactive uh, that is on the NASA website that you can go and track where Perseverance is today. This is, of course, from Sol Zero or landing day. And you can see the blue circle there is the landing area itself. And, and this mission's landing was remarkable in and of itself. This is one of the tightest, smallest landing zones we've ever had for a Mars mission. And we nailed it. We got within a mile of the center of that landing zone. Um, just incredible. Thanks to the Sky Crane technology and the upgraded navigation system. And so Perseverance is following NASA's directive for a Mars mission, which is to follow the water. And we know on Earth where there's water, there's life, which is why we're doing that. And so we have this really incredible uh, example of an ancient lake bed here that not only had feeding in from a river, but we see on the other side of the crater um, an output of a river. But really what we're looking at, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, is over to the left of side of that landing circle, um, that beautiful river delta, um, because river deltas here on earth are great locations to uh, preserve evidence of microbial life. So we're really excited to get uh, started investigating that. Now, the big news yesterday, of course, was the landing video from Perseverance. This is the first time we've ever had a landing video on Mars. So we're so excited to share that with you now. A couple things, you'll hear some audio going. Uh, it's the same audio if you watch the landing live that you heard from Mission Control before we had the video. You'll also see some images go across the bottom of your screen uh, to be able to give a feel for where the uh, rover was in its entry, descent, and landing. So with that, let's take a look at this incredible video. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Charge. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. 
We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. TRN Safety Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. Getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. And those are some excited people there, rightfully so. This is the first time we've ever had images like this. It's truly incredible. And scientists and engineers have been able to learn so much from it already. And the press conference they were looking at springs that were in the wrong location, all sorts of detail. And what's even more amazing is that eventually we'll have that video in 4K. So fantastic images coming from Mars, including you heard them mention they had signal from MRO, that's the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which of course was listening for Perseverance as well. And it even captured an image of Perseverance in, during its landing when the parachute was deployed. What's really incredible is that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was 435 miles away from Perseverance at that time, and Perseverance was traveling at 6,750 miles per hour. What a shot to be able to get this. So exciting to see this landing. And of course, images started coming back minutes after the landing. This was one of the first color images that we got, which features one of the tires on Perseverance, uh, those wheels as well as some of the nearby regolith. Um, and this was taken by one of the hazard camps. So Perseverance has 23 cameras on the rover itself. Uh, the hazard cams are really looking for hazards as the, they navigate this sometimes rough terrain. But what caught my eye are the wheels itself because we've gotten a lot of comparison between Curiosity and Perseverance. Their bodies look very similar. Both are powered by plutonium, not solar panels. But there have been lessons learned from Curiosity and Perseverance as its own rover with its own mission and own set of instrument suites. And so the wheels have changed. I wanted to show you this image for scale to give you an idea of the size of the wheels. If you look at a modern SUV, the rims, not the tires themselves, but the rims are about 20 inches. And that's about the size of the wheel here. And so if we look at the wheels from Curiosity, we can see as they navigated the really rough terrain of Gale Crater that they took a lot of damage because these are just aluminum and the aluminum on the skin of the tires or wheels, I should say, for Curiosity were only about a tenth of a diameter of a dime. It's, it's pretty smaller um, or half the thickness of a dime, excuse me. And they did get some damage and this wasn't unexpected. This had happened in tests here on earth but with a heavier instrument package, and of course that desire to take samples, Perseverance needed more robust wheels. So they actually are slightly narrower than Curiosity's wheels, but a little bit wider, bigger in diameter. It's a little hard to see in this comparison, but you'll also notice the tread is different. Um, there is much more uh, tread on the Perseverance wheels and not that chevron shape, which Curiosity actually used um, as a distance marker in images. So very cool to see some engineering upgrades, really subtle changes. And of course, we've, we've got a love for this rover um, because so many parts were engineered here in Colorado. Not these wheels, but um, other parts that were mission critical. So looking back, I have more images from Perseverance. This is one of uh, the first high resolution color images that came back. This was taken on landing day. Another view from that hazard cam. Starting to look a little bit truer color. You can see some details off on the surface um, and just really hints of what's to come for this Martian landscape. But this, this is what I was so excited to see yesterday. They released not only the landing video, but over a hundred unprocessed raw images and a handful of just 
beautiful color images, including this first panorama from Perseverance. So to give you a bit of an orientation, off to your left, you're seeing uh, kind of the more towards the front of the rover, you're looking south in the crater. And then towards that rear wheel on your right, that back wheel is west. You can see very low on the horizon, uh, that river delta, that perseverance is going to uh, be investigating. So it's all about getting systems online, doing checks in these first few days, making sure everything is working nominally or as designed, and then we'll start to drive and really see the science results. But because the science results are so focused on that biology and finding those physical and chemical signatures of microbial life, it's really important we have a clean spacecraft. So one of my colleagues from Planetarium across the country sent this to me, and it is a very 2020 cartoon, but it brings up that great point that if Perseverance is going to find these signatures of life, we wanna make sure what it's detecting is from Mars, not something that's hitched a ride from Earth. And beyond that, we wanna protect Mars from Earth microbes. We don't wanna protect Mars. So this is where the Planetary Protection Office comes in. And for Perseverance, this is uh, Mujige, excuse me, Stricker. She's been part of this mission, obviously, since Perseverance was built, making sure it is the cleanest spacecraft we have ever sent to Mars. And so these are some images when they were doing testing with Perseverance here on Earth. You can see they're in a bit of an odd environment. If you haven't seen images like this before, this is a clean room. Um, and what folks are wearing are those bunny suits to make sure stray hairs or microbes from us don't contaminate the rover. And to give you an idea, there are fewer than 10,000 particles in half a micron. So half a micron is about one two hundredth uh, the width of a human hair. And we can't build a completely sterile spacecraft, but we can have really robust cleaning and sterilization procedures baking these spacecraft, and they took tons of swabs to make sure those really hardy spores, that's what's gonna make it to Mars, um, were very, very minimal. So the engineering itself, again, an amazing feat to be able to complete this cutting edge science and hopefully contribute to a sample return. Now, we haven't started that science yet, nor many of the engineering tests. Some of you were asking about our friend Ingenuity in the chat earlier. That is that helicopter you're seeing there on the right, which will be the first time we've ever flown a helicopter outside of Earth. And so with a very thin atmosphere, because Mars is a relatively dormant planet, dead planet, it doesn't have uh, a magnetic field. It doesn't have a thick atmosphere because we think that core has cooled. Um, it's a challenge to fly something with a thinner atmosphere. So we're excited about that. It is also going to be taking images, helping to uh, choose Perseverance's path on its way forward. So stay tuned. In the meantime, I can share the good news they shared at the press conference yesterday that it is functional. It's charging right now. It's still underneath Perseverance in that cradle built by Lockheed Martin. Um, but as soon as they are ready to launch it, hopefully in the, about the next month or so, they'll be able to uh, set that aside. It'll be powered on its own. And Perseverance will start charting its course and start analyzing some samples. We'll start learning a lot about this exciting location on Mars. Now, if you want to learn even more about this mission, we did a fantastic, in my opinion, unbiased uh, event around the landing of Perseverance, which is on our YouTube channel. So if you check it out, about the first hour, we had some really special guests uh, that were experts in Mars geology, their atmosphere, as well as engineers from Lockheed Martin and JPL sharing the excitement of the mission, what all of the engineering that went into it, what does that rover body look like, and what are we going to be studying? So check that out on our YouTube channel. And I'm also pleased to say Dr. Steve Lee has agreed to come out of retirement for a second time, um, and will be rejoining 60 Minutes in Space next month to give you all an update on perseverance when that science really starts coming out. So stay tuned. We're excited to have him join us. Now, just two more stories, and I wanted to switch gears a little bit. And while it's still in the solar system, the story really deals with astronomy as a whole, because astronomy is truly data driven. We want the highest resolution images, the most information we can get out of images, spectroscopy, any sort of data. This is how we study the cosmos. 
And for radio astronomy, which complements you know, our optical views, what we see with our eyes or with optical telescopes, we really did have a tragedy at the end of 2009 with the loss of the Arecibo telescope. But never fear, scientists and engineers are already working on a way to get data that is closer to what we could produce with Arecibo with other telescopes here on the ground. So enter the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. This is the largest steerable radio dish anywhere in the world, but it's only about a third of the diameter of Arecibo. Arecibo was 985 feet in diameter, where Green Bank is just 360 feet. And for telescopes, whether it's radio telescopes, visible light telescopes, you want the biggest diameter you can get because they're like light buckets. The more diameter you have, the more light you can collect, the more information you can get. But the instruments that are on those telescopes can really help us make the best of any telescope. So Green Bank has partnered with actually a defense contractor, Raytheon, to be able to improve their capabilities. And after two years of planning their first test, they released a truly spectacular image of our moon. So to give you some context, this image is from the Apollo 15 landing site. You can see just off to the right of Mare Ibrium, which is a volcanic kind of area. And we'll zoom in and get a closer look. So this is, this is stunning. You can see features as small as 16 feet in diameter. This is really impressive for any uh, telescope here on the Earth. So that kind of snake-like feature you're seeing down the middle is called Hadley Rill. Um, it is likely a collapsed lava tube. So evidence of past volcanic activity on the moon. Um, you see a crater there up on top, cleverly named Hadley C. Um, and it's only about four miles across. And the way we created this image is a little different than uh, just taking a picture. They used radar. And so Raytheon helped build the transmitter that sends out a radio signal, which bounces back. So think of bats and echolocation. It allows them to see the world around them by bouncing sound off of different surfaces. Well, radio telescopes like Green Bank send out a radio signal and it bounces back and they time how long it takes for signals to get back. So features that are closer to us, of course, that signal is going to return faster, further away, it will take longer to respond. And that's how you can actually build an image like this. Now, this is just the first test. They believe this instrument will allow us to get data from as far out as Uranus and Neptune. So stay tuned, scientists and engineers still working at the National Radio Observatory, Green Bank um, Observatory to get us more fun information there. Now, for my last story, I want to wrap up uh, a story we talked about last September, which was about Venus, because as much as I just talked about how exciting getting that data is for astronomy, it's also about how you analyze it and understanding that data. So if you recall back in September, there was a really exciting announcement that scientists had announced using radio telescopes, um, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope and the Atacama Large Millimeter Array down in Chile, they detected a spectral line, or it's, which is like a light fingerprint of phosphine on Venus. And phosphine got us all excited because here on Earth, it's often produced by microbes. So what's going on in the atmosphere of Venus? And to their credit, the scientists on this paper said, prove us wrong, look at our data and keep doing more analysis. And that's just what's happened with two new papers that were released. Um, and so we had one, a couple of different things happen. In November, Alma, the team from the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, realized there was a mistake in the way they processed the data that led to that initial finding. And so they released that out to the public in November, and scientists have had a chance to take a look at that. So there was an astrobiologist from the University of Washington, as well as scientists at JPL that led a study re-looking at that data and they say they just can't find that line of phosphine at all. It was pretty faint to begin with. And with the new processing of the data, which is made public, and of course, scientists, this is how science happens. You relook at that data, you get an independent team to do that. But there was, interestingly, a second team that looked at the data from Hawaii, from the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, and compared it with computer simulations of, of Venus's atmosphere. 
And they concluded that what the team originally thought was phosphine was likely actually sulfur dioxide, which is pretty darn common on Venus and probably just a slightly different altitude. Those lines, those fingerprints, just like human fingerprints can be very close to one another are sometimes hard to distinguish. Um, and they think possibly we're not seeing that phosphine. So unfortunately, not a super exciting discovery um, like we had back in September, but there's more observations planned of Venus over the next couple of years that hopefully will bring clarity to this because all the teams admit there's wiggle room. And if we get higher resolution data, if we get more of it, we might be able to confirm finding either way. So keep your fingers crossed for Venus having some exciting new life. And with that, we can turn it over to your questions. I see we've got lots of chat here. All right. <clears throat> awesome, that was amazing. Thank you for all that cool information and amazing videos and graphs and things. So much cool stuff. Um, so I saw Kachun put a short answer to this in the chat, but a lot of people are wondering what happens in our solar system over billions of years? Can gas giants become rockier planets? Do they continue to grow? How does this model continue? Yeah, so um, our solar system um, has been you know, mostly cleared out, but there um, is still a lot of debris but that debris um, you know, is in the form of asteroids and comets. Um, the largest asteroids are hundreds of uh, miles across, uh, but um, you know, they um, can range down to tens or even a few miles. Um, and there's just a continuum of objects going all the way down to uh, basically space dust. Uh, but if you look at all that um, debris that's um, in um, kind of the inner um, solar system, there's really not that much material left. And so our planets, um, as they accumulate um, this, as um, this space dust rains down onto the Earth, you can expect um, all the planets to slowly grow over time. But um, for some of the smaller worlds, I mean, there's also um, loss of gas as well. So um, for instance, on, on the Earth, hydrogen gas is too light uh, to be held um, in, um, in our atmosphere or, or on the Earth's uh, surface, and so it basically rises and um, escapes into space. And um, we do um, lose hydrogen and, and helium gases. Um, I mean, th these are byproducts of, um, of uh, radioactive decay. And so um, there is some slight um, loss. And uh, I think, um, but um, for the larger planets, they're ba uh, basically big enough um, gravitationally to hold on to all their um, gases. And um, so they will uh, definitely continue to grow. Although again, because there's really not much uh, material left in the solar system, um, none of the planets um, will grow by very much. Nice, nice. And Naomi, uh, do you know if there's any significance to the design that was on Perseverance's parachute? There was actually, and this is a bit of a challenge that the engineers released. Uh, so I can choose to spoil it or not. Um, but there is a, a message out there. It's already been decoded. It's on the internet. Um, but it says, dare mighty things. So uh, pretty inspirational message um, and really cool that we got that video to see that so clearly. And um, <clears throat> Perseverance is gathering rock samples, mm -hmm. the intent that they're gonna go back to earth. How is that gonna happen? So that's a really exciting part of Perseverance's mission that's far down the line. We're probably a decade or more out from that because we don't actually have the spacecraft there yet to return the samples. That will be a collaboration between the European Space Agency and NASA um, in the future. And it will be dropping these off relatively centralized location. These will be collected, launched back to earth because we just have so many more tools here on Earth to be able to study these rocks than we can possibly send in a rover. Not only does that become very expensive to launch, it becomes very hard to, to navigate an ever increasing size rover with these huge laboratories. And frankly, sometimes humans looking at things, we're really good at noticing patterns. We can just pick something up that's really subtle. So uh, stay tuned, we'll be getting more information as those missions are planned, but as of right now, TBD, ex the exact details. 
Very cool. <clears throat> um, just a quick follow-up question. There are Martian rocks on Earth. How did we get those? There are Martian rocks on Earth. In fact, we have some really amazing samples of them in our all new Space Odyssey exhibition called the Tissant Meteorites. Um, just like Earth, Mars and the moon get hit by meteorites or rocks from space that can kick up a bunch of debris that's sent out into space. And sometimes Earth gets in the way of that debris. It lands here as a meteorite. And so we can study um, you know, if there are any gas bubbles in there and just the general composition of those rocks and determine they're actually from Mars um, and not an asteroid or the moon or, or even here on Earth. Amazing. And for Kachun, people are asking, how do the various accretion models account for the asteroid belt? Yeah, that's um, something that um, the scientists building these models um, do um, worry about because um, when they build these models, these computer models, um, obviously there's a lot of random randomness um, in the evolution of the solar system. So if you were to go back in time and to rerun uh, the solar system from scratch, um, you might not get exactly the same um, layout or the same um, numbers of planets or um, you know, the planets might be in slightly different orbits and so forth. But, um, and so what um, the scientists do is that they run lots and lots of these simulations. And so they hope um, that um, by repeating these simulations with um, slightly different parameters, uh, they can understand um, you know, it, you know, whether um, the layout of the solar system as we see it pops out enough in their computer models. And so um, having an asteroid belt, having um, the planets, um, you know, I, I did a short overview at the very beginning of my talk about um, where the planets are distributed and what they're made up of and how big they are. And so what you hope to do is to be able to run your models and to be able to at least have you know, enough of your simulations um, show that, the, um, that our current layout of our solar system isn't like a one in a million or one in a billion occurrence. Um, if it's, you know, um, if, um, and some of these simulations do get pretty close. And so um, they do worry about uh, making sure that the asteroid belt isn't too large or too small in their simulations. And is the asteroid belt material that didn't coalesce into a planet or is it a planet that got blown apart? Yeah, it's likely that it's material that never uh, coalesced into a planet. If you actually added up all the material in the asteroid belt, I can't remember what the number is, but um, it's probably on the order of the size of our moon or less. It's actually not very much material at all. So it's not really enough material to make a substantial planet. And um, it's unlikely um, to have been a planet that broke apart. It's more likely it's just material that was left over and never um, got accreted um, by any other body. Very cool, very cool. And Naomi, if we're planning to pick up the samples, mm -hmm. How did they, they're packing, they must be packing them up in a way that we know we can pick them up. Little lunch boxes? Totally, yeah, Star Wars lunch boxes, just for you, Mitch. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so they are, are doing some core samples and different rock samples that obviously we know the instruments very well. If Curiosity is gonna be a defined size, shape, um, we have a rough idea of the weight. So that will all help with, with the engineers and have a, a rough plan of how many we're gonna take, but of course, <laughs> Sometimes we get excited. Shiny rock, we need a sample. So, um, but there will be a, a weight a weight limit, of course, launching those back. And people are asking, how big is Perseverance? Perseverance is sizable. So remember that comparison. Those wheels are about the size of the rims of small SUVs. I'm trying to remember the exact dimensions, but it is. If you look at compared to Spirit and Opportunity, which we have a full scale model of at DMNS, it is significantly larger than that. So think golf cart size, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, which launching to another planet, that's not small. Yeah, <laughs> and it's heavy too. Um, yes, and, and every pound costs millions of dollars to launch. So those, you gotta believe every single camera instrument and everything was selected to do multiple functions and really support that mission. And there are so many cool instruments on there. We should be getting some really amazing images, hopefully very soon. Very cool. And Kachun, here's a big one. How and when did we first start to discover what the other planets were made of? Yeah, that's a really um, good question. Um, obviously, if you look at a planet um, with your eyes in the sky or look at it through a telescope, um, you, know, you might see a disk um, in a telescope that doesn't um, immediately tell you what something is, is made up of. 
Um, and uh, we didn't really um, you know, begin uh, to learn that until we had much more sophisticated instruments. And so there is an instrument called a spectrograph, which um, breaks up the light from, well, it could be uh, from a distant planet, it could be from a star, it could be uh, from a, um, a gas in a gas tube in your laboratory. Um, but um, any element and any molecule in our universe has a distinctive um, electromagnetic um, signature if you excite it um, or if it's at a um, given temperature. And so um, by um, understanding the physics of how matter um, emits light and or absorbs light, and by um, using instruments like spectrographs um, where you analyze the light um, coming from distant objects, you can basically um, determine what the uh, planets and stars are made up of, even if you cannot actually go there to sample, you know, and, and to, to pick up in, in a test tube um, that material. Although now, as uh, Naomi has been talking about, you know, with Perseverance and the future sample return mission, we will be able to bring back uh, samples uh, from Mars. And in that case, you know, we, um, the scientists on Earth will be analyzing um, the, the samples for much more complicated molecules um, than what we can um, easily determine from uh, spectrographs. So there's definitely a place for spectrographs, but there's also a place for much more sophisticated sampling and, um, and determination of chemical uh, compositions. Very cool, very cool. Well, it's just about eight o'clock. So just one last question for both of you. Uh, we'll start with Naomi. What are you most excited for in the next month of space science? Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, I'm really excited to see some of the perseverance science really start. Uh, we also will likely start getting data back from the United Arab Emirates mission. Um, and the Chinese mission will be finalizing their selection uh, for a landing site, likely some in Utopia Planitia in the northern part of Mars. So lots of exciting things uh, happening in that world in the next month and even more happening in the world of human exploration too. Very cool. And Kachun, same question. Yeah, so unfortunately, because uh, most of my uh, topics are um, about the solar system or, or beyond um, and, uh, and not with any planetary uh, missions, um, I usually don't um, start looking at stories until, uh, you know, very close to um, the night of our um, events. Um, but um, I will say, you know, as far as big astronomy uh, news, um, probably the, um, the biggest mission for astronomers, um, and in these astronomers studying outside of our solar system, not um, scientists looking inside of our solar system, is the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is scheduled for later this year in October, I think. And so um, that's gonna be something that all astronomers will be looking forward to. Um, so that's not quite a month away, but um, it will be pretty exciting when it happens. And I'm sure we'll be having lots of coverage of that. All right, well, very cool. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our space scientists, Naomi and Kachun. Um, and yeah, we hope you all have a lovely evening and we'll see you next month. And hopefully we'll hear even more amazing things from Perseverance and other missions. And thank you so much again, have a wonderful evening.